I have three brief announcements before I introduce tonight's lecture. Um, an exhibition of the drawings and models from the downtown Los Angeles design shred is currently on display in Cyrex Architecture Gallery. It will be on display until November 5th, and the gallery will also be open tonight uh, after the lecture. The second announcement pertains to next week's speaker, Jorge Silvetti from Boston. Uh, he'll be lecturing on Thursday night instead of the traditional Wednesday, Thursday, November 3rd at 8 p.m. And his final announcement is there will be a special lecture this semester by Herman Hertzberger of Holland. Uh, this will be on November 14th at 8 p.m., uh, which is a Monday, and at SIRE in the auditorium. Stephen Hall studied architecture at the University of Washington at the AA in London. He's been practicing independently since 1977 and has received awards in two international housing competitions as well as three progressive architecture design citations. He's the founder of Pamphlet Architecture Magazine and adjunct professor of architecture at Columbia University. Tonight's lecture is entitled To Invent an American Vernacular. Stephen Hall. Well, thank you for inviting me here. It's, it's kind of exciting because this school has mythological status, and I've always wanted to see it in the flesh. Um, I hope to be around tomorrow to go through the studios and see what's going on. I'd like uh, people to try to formulate critical remarks as they look at this lecture, because in a way, the only way to get things out of a lecture is to have someone make comments afterwards. So I hope to get some criticisms. In fact, the lecture is a difficult one for me because I'm, in, a, in effect, it's a struggle. <clears throat> the title, To Invent an American Vernacular, is more of a reflection. It's not a proclamation. Um, could I have the first slide, please? I made a diagram which, for me, um, reflects a kind of struggle that I'm going through in my work. <clears throat> and it's a struggle that has to do with whether one makes uh, architecture as an autonomous art or, or whether one recognizes that architecture is a cultural statement. And I see it as a kind of teeter-totter, balance, tug-of-war, I don't know uh, exactly what, but because of of a lot of things I feel about American cities, a lot of things I think um, should be done in terms of the urban fabric, I see that there's a necessity to reassess architecture as a cultural statement. And, and yet I don't want to give up the idea as uh, architecture as an autonomous art form. I have taken in my work <coughs> the vernacular or the lower forms as <coughs> a kind of model and there's a lot of reasons, and which I'll get into later. The lecture is in two parts. The first half really is uh, some of the research we've been doing and publishing in the series Pamphlet Architecture. The second half is what we do in the studio, what we're trying to build, and the relationship between them is really this, this balance or the tug of war. <coughs> Three years ago, I should say just as an introduction, we've been trying to publish um, a series of little magazines. Um, we made up the title Pamphlet Architecture in 1977 with the idea that young architects should make as much effort to clarify their works polemically as they do um, sort of just to make beautiful drawings. And so the series Pamphlet Architecture is really dedicated to trying to make sense out of what it is we're doing. This was the fifth in the series and it was dedicated to American um, urban buildings. <clears throat> the title of it was The Alphabetical City, and it was really a, a building types catalog of American uh, buildings which I discovered in Chicago, New York, Seattle, in fact in every urban uh, gridded town in America, which had 
relationships which were strangely coincidental. In fact, I started to see U forms reoccurring in virtually every city, E forms reoccurring, regardless of whether they were rendered in Art Deco, uh, neoclassical, or whatever stylistic rendition, uh, rendition. The building type forms seemed to reoccur and were related to the light and air dimension um, of the depth of the building section and the grid plan, which is specific to American cities. I'm not going to go into this pamphlet. Um, I just want to show a couple of images from it. For instance, this is the Astor Court in New York on Broadway and 79th. Two U forms, two different buildings interlocking, and how uh, different architects, when responding to this kind of composition, can relate to one another on an urban scale. In fact, everything from the pamphlet, <coughs> from the smallest building types to the largest ones, was a way of trying to distill how things could interlock and form a whole in terms of the city. You can see dumbbells, step tower, and a U building composed on a city block. And one of the most memorable examples from that pamphlet was the twin tower blocks, <coughs> which can be found along Central Park West in New York. There's a string of them, all virtually the same type, all virtually uh, uh, similar in terms of what they do to define the edge of Central Park West and the city um, block edge, and yet each one completely different architectonically in the window divisions, in the uh, architectural um, stylistic uh, portrayals in the buildings, so that they became for me a kind of idea that was underneath something was, it was below a stylistic argument of architecture. The last one uh, we produced was pamphlet number nine, which is a kind of uh, doghouse companion of the big buildings. I took all the little buildings, uh, dividing them into the urban and rural, and cataloged them. And I'd like to go through these just as a kind of, uh, a few of them, the ones that will later relate to the buildings that we're actually designing. <coughs> We organized the pamphlet from the smallest common denominator to the largest. Um, so in the urban buildings, in the urban houses, the smallest building form I could find was this little tiny building that develops in Philadelphia called the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or Bandbox Building. It's one room on a floor, 20 by 13 feet usually, and really was a result of of block and lot pattern divisions in Philadelphia. So that this building type reoccurs all over the city. You, once you realize what a Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is, you can find them everywhere. And sometimes they're lined up and creating a kind of street passageway. And other times they're abandoned or kind of other buildings have been torn down and they stand like miniature little towers in the backs of lots. They're very amazing little things going up in complexity in New Orleans. There's a very uh, prevalent building type called the shotgun house. Its development is a combination of deep block patterns in New Orleans and the uh, uh, lot widths. But the name, sh shotgun house, is actually folklore. And the idea was that you could shoot a gun through the front door and the bullets would emerge out the back of the building. And it's interesting that these, uh, these titles of the buildings uh, really are folk titles. They're not put on by historians. And in a, a certain funny way, the development of the folklore around those notions um, is even more complex. For instance, in the shotgun, there is a series of shotguns. Uh, there, was a, there was a superstition that the evil spirits could penetrate through the house the same way the shotgun could go through. And so there's a series of these houses that have been built with staggering doors to prevent the evil spirits from penetrating the building. And in the pamphlet, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of them in New Orleans, but I'll just give a couple here just as you can see them. Another um, generation of that building type is the double shotgun, which is really a party wall down the middle. You know, it sounds funny, but in New Orleans, everyone knows what that means, so it's, it's not. This one, um, in New Orleans, which to me is one of my favorites, is the camelback shotgun. <laughs> and 
the reason this building developed was that you would be taxed for a two-story building if you added two stories at the street front. But if you, if you wanted to add more room, you could add it on the back and not be taxed for a two-story building. So you have this strange building, which there's hundreds, again, hundreds of them. This is a Camelback under renovation. That's a, not such a nice one, sort of a mean Camelback, that one. And, and in the pamphlet, there's a, n a number of them, but I just want to make a synopsis here. <clears throat> Another one, urban, is the Flounder House. And it was interesting that in the research that I did for this building in St. Louis, they thought this was unique to St. Louis. And in Alexandria, Virginia, they thought it was unique to Alexandria, Virginia. So I find it very, was very curious that neither uh, of the local historians realized that they occurred in other cities. Double houses. I, there's plenty in Los Angeles. There's plenty in my hometown, Seattle. There's plenty in, in uh, Toronto. In fact, they call them semi-detached. George Baird has written article, numerous articles on the semi-detached. I just call them double houses. And here's a typical block in Philadelphia. And you can see how once that building type establishes itself, it really creates a street edge, in a sense, and an internal block edge. And some of them are designed in such a way that the image is one single building, but the actual building type is, is analyzed in this way with a party wall down the middle. And so that over time, they, they actually read in a very strange, and you can really, this happens a lot. It's, it's a and variations. <clears throat> in reading Pennsylvania, I, I, I discovered entire blocks of this incredible little uh, double house in a sense that the, the shared passage to the backyard was created by an arch between the two buildings. And this form um, may be in different colors and different materials and different um, styles, but the building type reoccurred. And sort of for my own uh, development, that, that the idea that some of the urban ones somehow get stranded and become rural ones by accident. Of course, row house groups where in this scheme, in fact, built um, in the late 19, uh, 1890s by Lewis Sullivan, <coughs> three separate building types become one image so that you have a kind of row house group, ABA. Frank Lloyd Wright did a whole series uh, similar in, in uh, Chicago. And the famous courtyard buildings of New Mexico. Um, this is Santa Fe. And I think what's interesting and significant about the courtyard houses is that they can be either urban or rural. And you can see the black ones blackened in. In the 1750 plan of Santa Fe there, around the town square there, urban buildings. And yet, out in the distance, they become rural buildings, the same building type. So rural houses. Purposely, we left out suburban um, work in, a, in an effort. Well, I, in fact, I won't go into it. You can bring that up in questions. But the rural houses were really um, beginning with the smallest common denominator. Again, the one-room house, the 16 by 16 cube. Um, it occurs in Nebraska. It occurs in New England. It occurs in Virginia. It can occur in sod or stone or clapboard or brick. But invariably, this sort of smallest common denom denominator is, is a very, I think, uh, telling statement in the notion of the house, the basic elemental form of the house. <coughs> Moving up in complexity is the, the saddlebag house, where there's a fireplace and a room on either side. And they occur all over the Midwest and can be seen as built in a total composition or as a one-room house with a, another single room added. <coughs> Going up in complexity vertically is the stack house, one room on one room. 
and I had trouble finding pure examples because most of them had additions on one side or another, but you can see this original stack house on the right. So one, and this is from the work of, of, of a cultural historian, not an architectural historian, Henry Glassy, who's done uh, ex extenuous work and research on this. You can see, you could probably make a, a lineage of uh, house forms typologically building up from the 16 by 16 cube. You see the stack house circle on the upper left and how different generic types evolve. The dog trot house, prevalent in Texas and uh, very well known there. Really two 16 by 16 rooms with a passage in between. Um, there are arguments that the, there are European antecedents for that particular form, that, that where, there were the, where there were animals on one side and humans on the other and fire in the middle. But basically the form can be seen all over the Southwest, especially in East Texas. And uh, the name comes from the dog, uh, you know, taking the liberty to run through the center of the house. This is a stretching dog trot, almost falling apart. The I-type house, which is really generic development of that same double room form with a central hall in the center. And there's many arguments that these houses really uh, developed out of the desire for the, the aspiration of the, the working farmer to create the biggest possible facade for his building with the smallest actual means. And this is the only one in the pamphlet which we actually decided to include and name ourselves. We call this the highway house <clears throat> because it's really a mom and pop grocery store uh, gas station condition. And most of them now are abandoned with higher speeds and more efficient different kinds of gas distribu distribution. But this particular one, for instance, has the bedroom over the gas pumps and there's another s 35 feet which drop to, uh, to, to the rear of that connecting to a railroad in the ravine. So it's a very interesting. The plantation house. And we look at this again to make a a redundant distinction typologically, which is to say we're not interested in whether or not the columns are Corinthian or Doric. The idea here is that there's a basic house form and there's a colonnade all around it and it's a very pure house form. And the interesting thing is, typologically, this building has no interior corridors and it reoccurs and reoccurs that the rooms interconnect with one another but the, those arcades that are on the exterior and, and these are all over the south really are the passageways. <coughs> That's the Kenner House outside of Louisiana, uh, New Orleans. And of course they come in all variations and you could probably do this with each one of these house types. You could find the different variations where the colonnade would be all around on three sides, two sides, one side, etc. So this is by way of transition into my own projects. This is a particular house type that we found in the Chesapeake Bay in 1978 when we had a commission down there, which was really the beginning of some of this research. <coughs> it's called a telescope house. And really, it, it's a folk term for what it really looks like, telescoping projections. Um, the only organizing factor that each uh, building portion have a similar roof form and that at the juncture between the two building forms there is probably a fireplace chimney. The interesting thing for me about this building type and looking at it was I thought there must be some real relation between cause and effect. So I started to study these individually and found that some of them were constructed in, in, in a, a sequence ABC where the first section was built first. The big section was built first. Others were built the other way around where the smallest section was built first. And still others were built all three sections at once. Um, so for me, this building type became a kind of emblem of this sort of lack of the historical connection of cause and effect, the kind of argument against the pure functionalism in the historic American building types. We had a site. Um, this project is from 1978. We had a site on the Chesapeake Bay, which was a very narrow site, which helped uh, 
the argument for using this building form. And we also had a program which was broken into three parts. There was a, it was for a retired couple, and there was a main living room den affair, which was a kind of close to the kitchen. And then there was a, f in the second section, there was a, a formal living room and dining room. In the back section, there is state rooms. So the idea of the back two sections could be broken off and closed off <coughs> most of the year. The site had a setback from the water's edge of 60 feet and from the access road of 60 feet, leaving a billable area of 34 feet by 420 feet. So it was, it was especially suited to this skinny house type. And also the views were to Chesapeake Bay and the sun came from the other side. So in order to get the rooms to both have an orientation to the water and have sun coming into them, if the building form was only one room deep, that would facilitate that also. <coughs> so you can see the building, the idea of the building was to sit naturally on the site and not be in a manicured uh, setting that all the vegetation would be just left natural and there would be a manicured courtyard between the garage, which is up above, and the main house. And the other requirement, besides the three-part program, was that he had a, a writing studio <coughs> that he wanted on the second level and he wanted no other rooms on the second level. So I suggested to him that it would be a very interesting thing if he had other, other than one access to that writing studio and convinced him that the idea of walking up the roof to the studio would be interesting. And this is a, just a pro progression of slides of the presentation drawings of that house. Coming in from the garage, walking through the courtyard. Construction was simple materials, integral color block, a stair to the observatory. You can see a kind of telescoping fireplace in the den. So the, the building became a kind of second uh, landscape that one could walk up from the rear stair up to the observatory and kind of passing by these uh, fireplaces which occur on the telescoping uh, portions. So in the development <coughs> of this building, we took our proportional rigor and so in a sense that when I'm looking at these building types and, and, and vernacular as they are put together in a certain kind of, a lot of times, sh slipshod way, what I'm attempting to do is to refine them and purify them and make something more out of them. And one of the ways that we've been doing this is to apply rigorously uh, a proportional system to the development of each scheme. For instance, in this particular house, you can see where a logarithmic spiral is actually the basis of the different divisions of the telescoping portions and actually creates, uh, uh, delimits the exterior elevations. <clears throat> the other thing about choosing a particular building type and trying to make a modern interpretation of it is that a lot of decisions are, are already made because if you're really truly making a telescope house, uh, the, the windows in the big portion of the telescope should be bigger than the windows in the middle portion and the, sm the small portion should, should have smaller windows so that the kind of window decision be sort of fell right out of the typological choice. This is a scheme, uh, this is a project that was built um, for the same client and uh, in fact both the, the things were done in 1978 parallel to one another. And this is his office in Millville, New Jersey. Um, it's just a courtyard addition on, on the back of a 19th century house which you can see at the top of the slide. And the idea is very simple. It was to create a space um, to save a, an existing grape arbor rather than create an object on the back of the house. In the site plan, which is the thriving town of Millville, we're trying to fill out the urban fabric, <coughs> but we don't have enough program. So you have a, an L uh, type thing which aspires to be a U. And you have a kind of dotted line there. You can see where it wants to be a U to create that courtyard. But in a way, these 
kind of, I mean, it's a U-shaped building. It, it never could make it. But in a funny way, it's a plan also that he can follow in the future because he does want to expand again. And so filling out that second part of the diagram really is going to be something that he will desire to do. This is a very low-cost project just done in stucco and concrete block. <coughs> again, preserving the grape arbor existing. and creating a kind of entrance and exit pavilion um, out of the, the sort of morphological necess necessity. And he liked it, um, but I had a hard time convincing him that it wasn't the place that he should put his garbage cans. <laughs> so um, I'd like to go to the next carousel. And this is just a, a form of a U-form house sitting in the landscape. Could we have the next slide carousel? This is a project which was actually done for an artist who had read the Alphabetical City pamphlet and was very excited about these letter form buildings. And we talked, and he wanted a house, and we talked, and he had a site on Staten Island, which is a wooded site. It's in a kind of suburban tract. Um, and he decided he did not want to clear the site. He wanted to leave the brush in the trees and put a little building in there and not really relate to the front yards and picket fences of the rest of the neighborhood. And it was a great ravine to the rear of the site, so that became a really workable idea. So um, I picked a simple U-form for the project as it had introspective courtyard to the rear, and that U-form could be contiguous with the edge of the ravine. So then the question became, OK, a generic, uh, a generic building type. Now how does this, this thing take on another meaning. And the house was for a very particular couple, um, Mike Metz and Madeline Metz. Madeline is a, a painter. She paints floral landscapes in every color in the rainbow. She has uh, a lot of plants hanging in her studio, loves sunlight, and has five cats. Mike is just the opposite. He hates cats. He, he, he works in black concrete and chicken wire and coal. <laughs> and he always works at night, and he says that it doesn't, he doesn't need to have any windows in his studio because he never works during the daytime. So I said, wow, this is really interesting. These people are like opposites. They're diametrically opposed to one another. And wouldn't it be interesting to make this U form charge, just take the simple U and try to charge it as much as possible with a kind of dialectical opposites in the wings. So that really became the, the idea, the central idea of the scheme. And also, we had a tough budget. Uh, the whole thing had to be built for you know, artists' wages. So trying to do that within a very limited means. So really, on, on one side of the building, you have her studio. On the right-hand side of the U-wing, you have her studio, which is very bright. It's sunlit by a monitor, which goes the whole distance in the studio. And on the left-hand side, down in the basement, in the lowest part, you have his wing, which is a kind of the other side of the U and has this grotto for mixing concrete and whatnot. In the middle, they didn't want a living room, which was weird. Um, well, it wasn't really weird, but I thought it was a little strange because they have a 12-year-old daughter, and, and I thought, this isn't really fair. They're, they're, they're two artists. They want these two studios. The kitchen was really the heart of the house. You can see it in the center there. The kitchen is a kind of U-shape microcosm of the, the outer building um, and, the, and the two bedrooms here on the left. So my idea was to, and it really doesn't show up in this section. Maybe it shows up in the next one. Well, up in the right-hand corner there. My idea was to make the 12-year-old the daughter's room a kind of little house by herself. So uh, we just made a, a roll roofing pyramid roof over her room and a kind of door onto the courtyard, which makes a separate entity out of it also helped to characterize the other side of the U-wing. This um, drawing, I try to do, every time we do a project, we try to do a different kind of axonometric, type of axonometric. I call this a lobotometric. You just <laughs> take the front off. And the idea was that you wouldn't have to, uh, I mean, somehow distill the building from the facade, because the facade was really covering up the more complex aspect of the building. This building was 
tight in floor plan and I, I really looked at Adolf Loos and his wonderful sense of the ROM plan, the, the room plan, which is the idea of volumes built around each other to try to get the overlapping spaces to work. I know that's totally out of style these days, but I really wanted to make these rooms bigger than they were. And um, I think it really works to be able to sit in the dining room and use, be able to look down into her studio from that dining area right by the kitchen. <coughs> the other requirement they had was one little space that they could escape um, from anyone, which wasn't either of the studios. And this became a little lookout tower overlooking the ravine. And it became a perfect uh, excuse for turning an otherwise dumb roof upside down in order to get a passageway up to that little um, hideaway or tower. And, and, and the edges of that upside down roof portion become skylights done in a very traditional, a kind of very aluminum windows uh, way, the light reflecting on the edges of the upturned roof section and creating a very uh, diffused light in the studio portion. And you can see the, the kind of little door to that little private chamber overlooking the ravine. Just different slides of the model. <coughs> of course, the, the, the reality of that two by eight roll roofing upside down roof is that if it was raining you would have a hard time getting up to that little studio. The building has a, an interesting, for me, has an interesting uh, character because any side of it seems to change and somehow change its period in architecture. I mean this was really not meant to be a medieval kind of building but somehow that rear uh, ravine where his grotto is and the, the door opens up so he can move his concrete sculptures out uh, somehow has that feeling. I was accused in this drawing of making terrorist trees. <laughs> but those trees really look like that on that site. And this is the only landscaping we did up here in the right-hand corner. Okay, this is a project which, for me, I've been working on this project for, since 1979, I'm still working on it. This goes through a lot of different developmental forms. The idea really developed, um, uh, we actually made a pamphlet of it in two years ago, kind of recording it up to this moment. But the idea actually developed from a competition that some of you may have heard of in 1979. There was a competition for a, a landmark over the railroad yards in Melbourne, Australia. We submitted this entry, which didn't win anything. I don't even know if it ever got there. Like so many competitions lately, you just sort of work forever and send something away and you never hear anything. But uh, it was really a simple idea. It was uh, to connect over the railroad yards a series of what I call urban arms, bridges, which would connect the street fabric to the Yarra River. And so I there were seven streets and I thought, well, we better come up with seven different kinds of bridges. And so I, starting from the left, I came up with a bridge of pools, hot, warm, and cold, a cultural bridge, a bridge of piazzas for Leon Creer, a bridge of ancient and modern col columns, <coughs> an office building laying down, a bridge of odd flowers, and a bridge of houses. So after the competition, and, and, and we realized we didn't, nothing happened, I was sitting one day and I was thinking, gosh, that idea of a bridge of houses is very intriguing just to develop in itself. And I started looking at uh, that notion. In the past, of course, London had this incredible bridge um, in the 16th century, which was really all houses. It was the only way into the city. Um, and you know, right up to the 20th century, Raymond Hood had proposed apartments on bridges connecting Manhattan to the boroughs. So I thought, this idea of a bridge of houses, the, 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 the metaphor of a bridge, um, the notion that, that a bridge could be a, a kind of something more than, than just a link between two, two points. It could be a, a, a means of getting from one place to another philosophically. In fact, I thought maybe it's a way of saying that certain things, certain 
contrary ideological positions could coexist in a static and, and complementary position. Um, the notion that one need not have uh, an overall philosophy that, that would in fact uh, one could develop a city from, just that philosophy. In fact, one needed to have some sort of notion that you could have separate, completely separate and very clear and very different ideological existences. And, and that would be a kind of utopia. So anyway, this bridge was built in our studio, connecting two sides of our studio. There was really nothing to, it was connecting one cloud or another cloud is a totally ideal concoction. And I thought, I'm, I, I would like to have seven different characters. So I had to write um, seven different programs. Um, and make up seven different stories. The social end of the bridge, of course, is this, this walkway, which is a kind of promenade, which connects all the houses at the, as, at the um, pedestrian level and creates a series of public courtyards. <coughs> but up above, the houses themselves are very, very different. In fact, almost contrary to one another. This house is the house of matter and memory. I want to read just right out of this pamphlet I want to read the first two houses just to show you how contrary they are starting at the right you see those little rooms which are like little cells there's a there's a, there's a I'm just gonna read from the first two that's the first one on the right and then the second one next to it this is kind of dedicated to the Italian rationalists the house of the decider everything is planned and worked out there are 24 sleeping rooms with a sink in every room. At the dining tables on the floor of the courtyard, there are 22 seats. Each day, three people work in the kitchen. Each day, one seat is reserved for a guest. Every morning, breakfast is served at 6 a.m. Everyone gets an apple and a buckwheat pancake. Every menu has been planned in advance for three meals a day for the entire year. The annual menu varies for odd and even years. It is possible to predict exactly what will be served on a given day 40 years into the future. <laughs> there are no surprises in the house of the decider. Okay, um, the next house over is this kind of weird plan and everything seems to be kind of moving around. It's probably dedicated to maybe, I don't know, a, a West Coast architect somewhere probably. <laughs> the house of the doubter. The doubter goes back on everything he says. He never intends anything. If he makes a decision, it is by accident. Each morning, the doubter f when the doubter finally gets up, he is never satisfied with sleep. He dresses with great effort. When making decisions on what to wear, his mind wanders to scenes of humiliation in front of lar large assemblies. The doubter's meals are tenuous. In the process of indecision, he eats directly from the refrigerator shelf randomly. <laughs> he listens to many voices each day, but he is very suspicious of them. He is most skeptical when hearing himself speak. The doubters make statements which he cannot believe. A at any rate, that's, there's sort of seven other versions, each one having a different plan and section. <coughs> So after that exercise in, in idealism, we decided, well, why can't we take this idea and make it become a pragmatic and practical thing, somehow make it realistic for some urban intervention? And we found this incredible railroad bridge which connects to your right-hand side, the upper right, the convention center, which is now being built in New York, and the West Village, which is on the lower left side, and that's the Hudson River right here. This is, and if anyone's familiar with New York, that's 10th Avenue, right around 23rd Street. And so the idea was to create 19 of these houses on this existing reclaimed railroad bridge, which is now being divested by Conrail and really is going to be up for grabs um, in a prime territory of loft conversions, create a kind of new residential consistency and a promenade. That's the existing rail link. It's 34 feet wide, in some places a little bit wider. And the, the notion, of course, some of the notions that we've been developing in, in the other pamphlets about uh, reinforcing the urban fabric with inter interventions carries through in this where you can see the 
new buildings aligning with the street walls of the existing fabric and creating this kind of uh, series of courtyards. So in this case, the buildings are trying to address very directly the predicament of New York. So New York, which has 18,000 homeless people wandering around in the streets, and this winter will probably be the worst, um, thanks to our president's policies or, or whatever. But um, the building, so this idea, again, is one of coexistence, but of the actual consistency of, of the problem of, of American cities, maybe, possibly. Anyway, the building on the right-hand side is a, an SRO hotel with tiny little rooms. The, the next one from the right is a typical one-bedroom apartment. The, the, the next one over is a very luxurious apartment, sort of two apartments to the whole building. And the f one on the far left is a student hostel with a, a single kind of common room and sort of dormitory rooms in each of the four towers. Of course, right now this is the only one that could be built and probably these things will be built, but with the idea of some sort of extra monies or, or different political policies, one could actually put these things together and make them coexist. <clears throat> Meanwhile, I got an invitation from a gallery called White Combs Gallery to exhibit this project, and I, I became very excited. Um, of course, no funds, but um, we decided to build this model, which was, it's, it's about seven feet long, um, and try to make this thing become more real somehow by making a more real model. And so the model is a, has a steel base with steel legs, and the buildings were made in, 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 in sheet brass with a wooden uh, structure inside. And, the, and then I had a kind of crisis because I realized I wanted the buildings to be different colors, but I didn't want to paint them. So uh, I had the idea of putting four different kinds of acid on the brass and getting uh, four different colors. These, the contextual buildings were built out of solid plaster blocks, which I'll never do again because you can't lift them after you cast them. <coughs> but one of the things that happened, which I didn't realize, is these acids turned the brass four different colors, but some of them take an incredibly long time. And so I had some buildings that turned, and that front building now is all pink, but during the exhibit it looked like it was burned out from the Bronx or something. <laughs> this is a sketch of the actual railroad bridge, and you can see the, the 1934 kind of deco-like railings that are existing, and our two buildings um, imposed on that drawing. You can see how it relates to the view of the Hudson River. And those are kind of the seven ideal houses sort of flying away after one who tries to make the pragmatics work. This is a project that was built while we were working on that project. We usually have two projects going on at the same time. I <coughs> wish we had more. Um, it's for a pro it was for a uh, sculpture studio and a pool house in a subdivision of New York. I mean, it's, a, it's an outer borough, uh, Westchester and Scarsdale. And when we first went out there, we weren't very impressed about the whole prospect. Um, there was really, it was just a, a lot of houses sprawling around a very uh, uh, kind of track-like area. And on the third visit, we found these stone walls kind of overgrown and covered up a bit. But they, they were dating from the, the latter part of the 18th century and were really uh, stone walls that were put there to divide up farm plots. And it just so happens that a lot of the, the suburban lots corresponded to the stone walls. And you can see up in the upper right-hand corner the rectangle which we were building in, the existing house on the upper right, uh, the garage to the left of that, and that little courtyard on the inside is our courtyard around which we were making this sculpture studio. And the idea was really to recall the history of this site with a notion of walls within walls and kind of make an echo of the, the earliest history of the site. <coughs> the, the swimming pool, which was already there, was a, a funny angled thing, and I tried to convince them that we had to turn it into a rectangle, but they, they wouldn't go for that. But um, basically, the rest of the scheme went totally as planned, making a, a kind of walled courtyard and the north wall of it becoming the sculpture studio. Again, another kind of drawing. This one is a, a parachute metric, which sort of 
comes up from the site plan, you see the walls within walls, and you have the kind of courtyard, which is really the heart of the scheme, and up from that, the, the sculpture studio, which is on the top level, and the pool house, which is on the pool level. The plan is very simple. Um, on, the, on the lower level, there's a passage, which is the main entrance to the courtyard on your right, um, a, a changing area, uh, a showering area, a bar serving area, and upstairs is the sculpture studio. And the building has a, a nice quality of unfolding as one comes up the driveway. Actually, this is, one, this is a sequence walking up the hill, but the walls sort of unfold around the building. The existing building you can see behind the house was by a, a John Weber, a Swiss architect that was done in about 1940, which has flat roofs and horizontal lines, so it worked very well with this concept of the walls. In the studio, the sculpture studio, we put the kind of main skylight directly over the entrance portal to the courtyard and helped create a kind of gateway effect at that moment. <coughs> That's Mark Mack's first concrete block chair, <laughs> which was part of an exhibition we made in New York for pamphlet architecture. Each one was to design a chair and put their pamphlet in front of the, their chair. And Mark Mack gave me this scribbly little thing about putting together these pieces of concrete blocks, so we built it. And he liked it so much that he's done, like, I don't know how many concrete things now. <coughs> this is a diagram which was uh, around the ideas of transparency, um, alignments, and the ways that the building can uh, get kinds of axes which go through it by alignments of windows, such as the two big windows, the two main windows, when they uh, align, that they create very interesting patterns with the sun on the walls opposing one another. And another alignment, which I was nervous of because I, could, I didn't know how to calculate it perfectly, but it, it works, was the corner of the building was sliced through um, with two round windows, which on March 21st trained the setting sun directly on the living room window of the main house. And, it, and that is the spring equinox and just happens to be the client's birthday. So luckily it all worked out. This is a diagram of that equinox idea sort of on the left-hand side, but also of the employment, again, of proportional systems which somehow relate every piece and part of the building um, together. The courtyard itself is a 55-foot square going down in a logarithmic spiral from that. The building's front elevation is almost a golden section. You can see how far it's off from that, how far that diagram goes off. Vertically, it's a golden section. Then down towards the windows, all the way down um, to the divisions of the pavers inside of it. This building, I had the opportunity of really carrying through in every detail. Um, the client was really wonderful about that. Construction is, is concrete block with insulation in the Ys stuck on the outside and plaster directly applied to the block on the inside face of the wall. going up the stair to the skylight studio. And the skylight has a kind of fastening effect. It changes as the sun rises on one side, gets brighter, and it turns during the day, and the light quality changes. Some of the drawings I use to present the scheme. It's interesting that all the parts of this building came from small, uh, shops. For instance, the steel windows came from Queens. The uh, skylight came from the Bronx. Um, everything in the building uh, came from these uh, blighted areas of New York, and, and it goes to a very rich uh, area of Westchester. So it's a kind of hidden political incentive, I think, to try to give these little worker outlets real projects. And the funny thing is that one can actually do things that one wouldn't think. For instance, that light, which we designed and had built, was built for around $150. And, and if you look at a Lighter Lear catalog, you really can't get a nice light for $150. So 
in a funny kind of way, I think we're discovering some things that are available if one's willing to go to kind of drive out to Brooklyn or, or drive out to the Bronx and deal with some of these little shops. <coughs> this is a, a kind of Stella, which is really a shower column. It sits in, a, in the shower, which is all white tiles all the way around, and it sits up six and a half feet high. It's just a solid kind of marble figure. This slide's not very good, but you can see the sort of mouth of it is the, the shower spigot and the two hands down here and the soap dish. <coughs> Another idea in the project was the transformation of the vertical plane or the facade plane and the horizontal plane. And, and the first notion of this, I started to think that the, the facade really, the first idea for me was that the facade would be reflected in the pool in the water of the pool and then I thought wouldn't it be interesting if one could take that as a beginning point and take certain elements and I didn't take it too far in this one but on the ground plane we had an electrode which had to come up 12 inches above the pool deck and it was for the pool light so I put a marble a green marble box around it and at the same moment uh, pulled the beam of the holding up the skylight outwards and put a marble box around that to kind of create this relationship And another thing that happened in the construction process, and I really believe that one, in, in Carlos Scarpa's words, has to flesh out a building because certain things happen when you're building it that, that are surprises and opportunities, is we unearthed this giant rock which was in the foundation, it was in the way, and they were going to have to haul it away. And I said, <coughs> don't haul it away, that's, you know, that's perfect for the courtyard. So we just upended it, and it's one of the stones which really are the same kind of stone that makes up the, the stone walls around the outside so that it becomes a kind of microcosm inside of that larger stone wall surrounding. It's a great place to sit when you come out of the pool because the rock seems to heat up and your bathing suit kind of steams when you sit on it. All the little, little things, I mean, I hope I can keep finding clients like this, uh, marble sills and brass handles on the windows and steel windows that are remarkably tiny and <clears throat> the kinds of things that you have to throw out when you have really tough budgets. And another thing that happened on this project was the client had a debt owed him by a, sand a, a, a glass etcher. So he told me he wanted some sandblasted glass in the, in, in the building and I, and I thought, oh no, not that stuff because I don't like that. You know, I've seen all the kind of restaurants in the Upper East Side with flowers and sandblasted glass. It makes me sick. <coughs> so, but then I started to have this idea. I thought, all these drawings in my drawer, all these doodles, the conceptual sketches, why not just give them to the sandblasting guy and have him make lenses and we'll make the doors around, you know, whatever they come out. So I pulled out a bunch of drawings and that's how you get this sort of strange pattern on the doors. But it became a kind of discovery because the interesting about the glass is, is the kind of light that comes through it. Um, not only is it a way of taking conceptual drawings, which somehow I don't believe in selling, and somehow they get dusty in the drawers and sort of are bothersome, somehow put them back into the architecture, and for anyone who's interested, they can read them all the way through. Um, but at another level, they're interesting just for the people who are looking at just the qualities of light. Um, for instance, this was part of a whole series of walls within walls and enclosure. <coughs> Excuse me, and this is part of two panels about transformation. When, when certain hard elements, when they're reflected in water, and there's another panel which is very um, undulating. At, at first, when we were doing this, we thought we would add color and paint in, in lines in the glass, but we decided that afterwards that the, the process really shouldn't have anything added to it because it changes in the sunlight and according to different times of day. And that last one is really one which is a, a little bit simplistic to me now, which is just walls within walls, which was the central idea of the, the slide of the uh, project. And this slide is really a, our whole office on the job site surveying the construction. That's Joe Fenton on the right and myself and Mark Jansen. Can I have the next carousel? I've got two more projects. This next project doesn't fit in to the title to invent American, an American vernacular, unfortunately. 
it's the biggest thing I've ever done, so I have to put it in here. Um, I, I don't think you can you can you can start to try to work on a philosophy, but up the road. So it's a very difficult site um, for an urbanist, um, and, and that's an existing building, which. Uh, in plan, this is the only enticing thing, was 79 feet by 125 feet, which is almost a golden section. But the existing building was really horrendous. And they were going to make, the program is to take off the front facade, gut the building, and save the concrete block shell and make a safe depository bank, which, um, which was a big project. And I realized that with the budget that they had, that it was going to be really tough to make architecture out of this. And besides the fact that, as you can see by those rows and rows of little cubes in the back, the safe deposit boxes is a system by a company called Bank Lock International, and you have to just take that system uh, as it is. There's no way of changing that. Um, <coughs> so I had the idea of just accepting everything and trying to organize it in some way that would have some meaning. So I really, I said, okay. Um, we accept all those boxes, we put them in a rectangle, that's the most rational way. I w I w I'll layer the project, you know, c to myself, I said I would layer the project from the dense and rational at the rear to the irrational and thin at the front. Which is where I'm going to try to do some architecture. Anyway, in the back you have a vault, which is a quarter inch steel plate, ceiling, floor, walls, everything, and stainless steel boxes just lined up. In the middle zone is a, a conference rooms and what they call coupon booths. And the front area on the right is a corporate office. On the left is a rental post office. And, and all I really could do really was to organize the lobby. Um, they said, well, we don't know what we want for a lobby. And so I said, fine, I'll take care of that. So I decided that <laughs> the lobby is going to be the architecture and the rest of it is going to be like a, just a, a, a fabric of sorts. And I didn't even look at what had to be done there. In a sense, I just did exactly what I knew had to be done. I put in lay in acoustical tile, um, the cheapest rubber base on the wall and all those things that make you cry. But I said that really the architecture is just that lobby and the organization of this building. <coughs> the facade in a way is a, very, is a very simple thing. It just reflects, it's like a slice again through what's really behind that facade. On the right are the, the door to the corporate offices. Um, in the middle is where that lobby intersects the front facade. And on the left are the post office uh, the rented post office boxes. But the lobby has a vestibule. One needs a weather lock between the outside and the inside in New Jersey. So in that vestibule, uh, you can kind of see a kind of distillation of a lot of the ideas that I was working on while, while um, developing this building. And in fact, I recorded them here in a kind of antithetical argument to one another. The outside becomes a point the outside two squares of the vestibule and the inside um, two panels become a kind of counterpoint. And one of the things that I was working on when I was, re I was reading parallel to the development of this, and one ha I, I really believe in that, one can't just do, do architecture because if you work late into the night and you get up the next morning and, and your brain can actually be just kind of pressed flat from the immense amount of little tiny details that, that, that that architecture entails. And so I'm reading, uh, parallel to the development of this building, I was reading about proportion and how the relation of music and proportion um, throughout history was, was a very interesting aspect. For instance, in the 16th century, there was this concept um, called harmony of the spheres, where they believed that the planets rotated in such a degree as to, to create the eight octaves. And I thought, that's interesting. And then I was studying uh, something else, which was the work of Johannes Kepler. And Kepler had the very, very famous diagram that, I, then, that, that anyone who studies mathematics would, would probably recognize, which is in one of these panels I'll show you in a moment, which was the idea that the planets, and there were only six at the time, would fit consecutively inside one another with the five geometric solids. So <coughs> part of the notion of this lobby is the notion that 
the separation of science, um, mathematics, and, and artistic deliberation is something that could be strived for again. I think that if you look at medieval times, there wasn't this kind of incredible division between uh, the science and the arts. And today, it seems to grow more and more pronounced. Um, the lobby really is a, is a kind of rotunda space in, in which we've done a kind of terrazzo floor pattern. That's behind the lobby. That's the bank vault. That's all business acoustical lay-in tile that just goes into the back. I just put that in to be honest so that you know it's, it's not all that lobby. Um, we did the furniture, which is only a couple of pieces, but around the top of the, the ceiling, around the, the wall, um, again, the furniture, just a simple marble slab for the coffee table and kind of golden section, wooden bench, seats. Um, but the ceiling has a kind of frieze which goes around the, the, the ceiling. I was making, I wanted to make a distinction between the vertical plane um, and the ceiling and I started to draw these bits, these kind of cube forms, and realized there were almost nine forms there. And I started to think about this harmony of the spheres and the relation. I was also lis listening to Gustav Holt's The Planets at the time, and, and kind, of, kind of came up with the idea of making nine planets. So really, that's, that, that those kind of uh, forms around the ceiling really start with Mercury. Venus, the Earth with the Moon passing through the center of it, Mars, which is the strangest planet of all, which has asteroids, of course. Jupiter is the largest planet, so we put it right over the door to the vault. Um, we lost some of the moons on the way to the construction site, so it should have five moons, it only has three. Saturn with rings, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto. And again, going back to the, the vestibule, the diagrams of these ideas kind of being recorded again in the vestibule, the layering from the dense and rational to the irrational and thin in the front. And there's a series of diagrams on music and on proportion, the relation of proportion in music. For instance, the, the composer Bela Bartok composed uh, complete pieces using only the golden section in his rhythmic uh, composition. This is part of that antithetical panel where you have um, planets in their orbits on one side and cosmic accidents on the other side. And there's Kepler's famous diagram with the planetary orbits and the five geometric solids. But the interesting thing today, of course, is that at that time, the reason that fits so snugly is there were six planets, five geometric solids and six planets. Well, there's still five, five geometric solids, but there's more than six planets. So on the other side of that panel, there's a kind of Kepler dissolved diagram, sort of floating. <coughs> anyway, so going back to our theme, these last two projects are small enough that they were inspired by these vernacular building types. And this one I'm just going to show just a couple of slides of was uh, a little guest cottage behind a, an addition we were doing. On the right you see a kind of house, <coughs> a kind of Cape Cod type of house. Um, that's what they called it. it. Didn't really have a building form or type. So the idea really was forming a couple of courtyards. But in the back we had a guest cottage which was formed really in the form of a stack house. One room on top of another with a skylight area above which has a kind of wooden shutter that one rolls back and forth in the sun. And again, this one is stretching the idea of a stack house, but the idea here is that one takes a building type and one can transform it quite a distance and still retain some residue of relationship. And this project, which I'm in the middle of struggling with at the moment, with the working drawings are finished, and I'm, I'm, I'm fighting contractors and the client and trying to get the budget at the right point. Um, the site is in East Hampton, but it's inland. 
there's the Atlantic Ocean at the base there, you can see in that slide. And it's quite a ways deep, deep in the island, and it's in a kind of very, very thick forest with th trees that are three feet in diameter. <coughs> and uh, this is, I put this in especially for teaching tool. This scheme I had real trouble with because she had a requirement of a lap pool. <coughs> and I couldn't make the lap pool relate to the house. And it was always some kind of a problem for me. And I did 13 separate designs <coughs> for this house before I showed her the first one. So um, for, for all the students who kind of cringe when you say start over, I think you have to sometimes start over. I never could get the lap pool to come into a relationship with about a 2,000 square foot house that I liked. I had, you know, sort of uh, the idea of the, the pool with a kind of courtyard around it. In fact, one of the biggest problems is a client comes to you and they want what you did the last time. So she wanted, she said she liked the pool house. She wanted, just take that and run it around the pool. <laughs> I, I couldn't do it. It just didn't work. This pool was 18 feet by 60 feet long. I can't, it, there wasn't enough to wrap around and all, you, well, you can, it didn't work. So one morning after 13 schemes, on the 14th scheme, we had this idea of breaking the program in half, putting the lap pool between uh, guest rooms on one side and the main house on the other and making the buildings themselves respond to the width of the pool and basically siding it kind of like a fallen log in the middle of all those trees and really kind of like a slice of a piece of Venice right, right in the woods. So um, basically on, on the left hand side you see the, the main house, um, a bow roof kind of giving kind of a character to the living room area on the left, master bedroom to the right of that, on the main floor a, a dining area, a kitchen, and a screen porch, the lap pool, and then aligning with a little guest pool house affair on the right hand side with a, two guest bedrooms and a carport underneath. And in a certain way, looking at that bottom slide, it's a kind of dog trot house, which was one of those first schemes that I did, split in half with a pool inserted. So that screen porch affair becomes this passage in between. The plans are very simple and, and straightforward, going from the basement level up the deck around the pool. And the trees are really uh, quite high in that area, so the building really will sit in the trees, a little bit like this drawing. And it gave occasion to put the diving board almost as a little tongue sticking off the deck of the pool house on the right-hand side. And the thing that I like about the house um, it's not the architecture I think is important here because it's a, it's a tough budget. We're using, I like to use steel windows with marble sills. We're using wooden windows, you know, Marvin windows. I mean, the building for me is important only because of the statement that the heart of the house is this void, is this water which reflects the big trees and the sky that are on the site. And after, you know, kind of working on it and working on it, I realized that really the the strongest thing about that place was the site. And I began to think that really, in a sense, that when one's in the middle of the swimming pool, one's looking, one's looking at a different kind of architecture than when one is experiencing it in actuality, walking through the building. So I began to develop the two facades, which are looking at one another across the pool in a very symmetrical manner. <clears throat> and in fact, it's the only symmetry in the whole building. And it's a symmetry which I, f I feel is denied. And it, it, in a way, you know, while teaching at Columbia, I'm faced always with an infinite number of uh, Villa Rotunda schemes. Um, and I, I'm always with the argument that you, you can't do that today. It doesn't mean the same thing. And for me, this building, in a way, gets at something, maybe not quite yet, but maybe I'll, I'll develop it in the next one, that, that there's a kind of empty center, which is not necessarily a pessimistic one. <clears throat> the other thing I like about the building is that when one approaches it, it's a double building, and if you approach it from either side, it's doubled again in the water, so it's kind of a, a double, double building. The 
two parts really aren't important, but that really is the heart of the scheme. So in conclusion, this project, which I'm not going to show you, is really something we're just, we've been working on on the side. It's a series of uh, autonomous artists' houses, which are based on the idea of different kinds of workers, a plasterer, a, a, a tin bender, a paper maker, um, etc., coexisting and all being based on that famous camelback shotgun type. Um, <clears throat> so in a way it characterizes that idea that I'm working with at the moment of, of a kind of cultural base and a kind of unity of cultural statement but the possibility that within that established base that one could find incredible artistic autonomy. And I think I'd just like to open it up to some questions. And I, I'm sure there must be some things in this work that bothers you that you can, you can think of some questions. We have the lights. thing was that I realized in the beginning that there was no way I was going to carry the whole building off as architecture. So I had to come up with, let's say, a, some thesis that would allow me not to. Otherwise, I couldn't do the project. It was just too much. It, you know, it would be hard to organize. And the, then, the, then the model, the idea came out that, that the nature of a public space is different from the nature of back rooms. And I thought of the idea of even, even you know, in the, in the, the late 19th century um, and early 20th century, public buildings like the post offices or, or bank buildings even, in, in American cities, like a post office, you'll have this front room, which is murals and things. And in the back, it's just all this workspace, very cages, you know, mailbags and whatever. So I looked at that, in a way, as a typological uh, comparison to that bank building. I knew I couldn't carry off the back parts of it. And I looked at it as the, that lobby as a public space and the rest of it as a private space. One other thing, if I may, I can't help but think about Duran when you're doing your kind of study. And for him, it was very much a system that Beaux Arts follow. And I wonder to what degree you saw your temple architecture as far as being something that you really felt people should. How far do you feel you should hear that? I don't see it that way at all. I think Durand is completely different. To me, Durand was an academic and, 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 and someone who was dedicated to setting a kind of, I would call it an academic model, um, which isn't, isn't necessarily something that, that one would derive from a culture. I'm trying to find a, a cultural statement. In other words, my attraction is the opposite of his, where he would shoot for the higher academic model, whether it's taking let's say, the Pantheon, and turning it into a post office, right, that big space. I would look for, let's say, some cultural phenomena happening in a locale and try to elevate that to a level of meaning. And maybe it's only the site. Maybe it's like some stone wall around, or maybe it's some building that you, that you see actually happening from the lower parts of the culture up. In fact, that's my other argument, which I didn't even get into, which is why I, take the, why I would prefer to take the vernacular as the most true cultural statement um, that one can make towards a culture. Bela Bartok, to me, was a great composer, one of the greatest composers of the 20th century, and he spent a good deal of his life going across the, the Hungarian countryside, connecting, collecting folk tunes, out of which he made modern music. And to him, that made more sense and had more meaning than one, let's say, one uh, do some sort of Wagnerian 
uh, composition. I mean, I, I, I relate to it at a different level. I think Durand is coming from just the opposite side of... So that's not models, it's, it's inspirations and things to be distorted or reformed. I, I was afraid you would ask that. Well, I, I guess I have always had the, the a problem with suburbia, and I see it both through the the consumption of the landscape. Um, I grew up in Seattle, okay, and it's it's a, it's a it has an urban base. Historically, it was an urban condition, and there's been in the in the years that I went to sc the architecture school there, the spread was immense. And one of the biggest things that I saw was just really the kind of final territory of all the natural wildlife around this incredible Pacific Northwest, not having you know, deer, don't have any place they can't get from their different runs, what, whatever. And I see the, the suburban problem is a very, very complex one, one that you just can't have a pat answer for. And one of the things I'm trying to do by looking at other models is dig at the possibilities of reinterpreting what could be an alternate position rather than just attack suburbia because I don't think one can do that it's like attacking yourself or something <clears throat> and so one of the things that keeps coming up is maybe in the future a kind of plan a game plan that one for instance right now in East Hampton where I'm building this house they don't want any more development because they see that it's just deteriorating the natural countryside the houses are too close together so they're going to instigate a five acre per house rule and I'm not sure that that's the right way to go. I think that one should maybe have hamlets or villages and then, you know, wider um, landscape left naturally. When, uh, when you were I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last one. Oh, I think one would always find that. I think, in fact, the Prairie House, I mean, that's, a, that's an incredible, uh, you know, important building type of Frank Lloyd Wright, this Usonian Houses development. But because we had this kind of strict notion of urban and rural, the Prairie House didn't have a place in that particular um, categorization. Uh, I noticed that in the Chesapeake uh, project, that you, you use that vernacular architecture telescoping. Is that a consistent policy of using a local vernacular architecture, or is this just a I, I, generator? You know, you, you know, Kenneth Frampton has written this new polemical text called Critical Regionalism. I don't know if you've read it, but that's a point, I think, of argument, because one of the things that I found in doing a little bit of research, and I don't claim to be some sort of a historian, is that what's very interesting is the fact that these things occur in widespread areas. You can find um, those telescopes exist, you know, in Texas. They're more prevalent in one area because of the vernacular culture, you know, kind of learning from itself and whatnot. But I'm not trying to advocate some sort of a regionalistic approach to architecture. I think it needs to be deeper than that. <clears throat> and in the, in the typological study, it's, it's more a trying to get at an elemental approach. For instance, in the Bay Area, I mean, you, you know, once you start in that path, then you say, okay, we're in an area where they only use shingles, so we can only build in shingles. I mean, it, that can just degenerate into a very dangerously unmeaningful approach, I think. So where do you draw the boundaries as far as looking for an American or, you know, this type of vernacular or something, a model? Where do you draw the lines as far as... Every, every, every project is different. And so, you know, you, you do a certain body of work, which is you're trying to develop some sort of polemical arguments. And you have some things that you, you know, that you, you hate that are, that are going on in architecture, but you don't address those. Instead, you try to find your own way. But then, in the end, 
every single project is different. And so that I, re I really have a hard time with that because I think that, that each situation has a unique set of circumstances and you can't really have a kind of set rule that you can apply. Thanks.